All right, let's uh, let's just continue this prayer time really quick. We're gonna we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to come and really speak to us uh, over the next hour or two, and and just ask Him to open our hearts, open our ears, and hear whatever He'd have us to hear. So, can we do that together? Let's just ask Him to ask Him to come and speak. Yes, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. We ask you to move in this place. We ask you to open our hearts and open our ears. Help us to hear fresh expressions, fresh ideas, new vision, new uh, thoughts. I pray, Father, that you would help us to break these barriers that we've listed, the things that are keeping us back from seeing uh, a movement of your spirit, a movement of disciple-making in this nation. We break it right now in the name of Jesus, and we ask that you would fill us with boldness, courage, fresh ideas, fresh vision, excitement, passion. We pray for uh, wounds that we may have uh, experienced to be healed right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I I pray that you would help us to uh, walk the path that you've given us and that you would give us fresh eyes to see and a fresh heart to feel what you long for, God, what your vision is for this nation and for the cities in which we labor. Help us to have your eyes, Father, in your heart. We pray this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, for those that are new, uh, that just came in for this evening, my name's Josh. Uh, I've been living in India for the last 15 and a half years and uh, grew up in the St. Louis area. I'm a big St. Louis Cardinals fan, sorry. Uh, it's, I know, they're in last place, I get it, okay? Uh, anyway, yeah, I, I know. We've literally not had a last place team since the 70s, seriously, we haven't, and it's, it's been bad. So, anyway, but uh, I still claim them, they're still my team. Um, but grew up, to, grew up in the St. Louis area and then moved to India, like I said, 15 and a half years ago. Met a beautiful woman, uh, Lashi. Uh, she's a, an Indian woman who is just unbelievable. I married way up. Uh, she's, she's an incredible woman. Yeah, right. Um, my son Jeremiah is here tonight, though. Will you stand up real quick, buddy? Just wave. Come on. Let's give Jeremiah a hand. Uh, he's, I've got a 14-year-old Josiah. He's my 11-year-old. And then we got a little girl, Zara. Uh, which uh, she's the princess of the family, right? Jeremiah and Zara fight quite a bit sometimes, but that's all good. She gives him a hard time a lot. Um, anyway, uh, so what I want to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes or so is, is just tell the story of what God has done in India. Some of you were here last session this afternoon. I told a brief version of this, but I want to get down into a little bit more detail and just talk to you guys about the opportunity that we have here in the United States to see some similar things take place, okay? But before we get there, let me tell the the quick version uh, of our story uh, just so that you can hear this. Now, some of you who heard some of it last uh, last session, we won't go into all those details that we talked about. I'll I'll hit on some different topics, so don't don't check out, all right? Um, But uh, so anyway... um, Back when I moved to India, um, here, here's a question that haunted me pretty significantly. I, I touched on it briefly last time, but I want you to really think about this because this is super important, okay? Um, are we disciples worth reproducing as leaders? The question that haunted me was this. The Lord really struck me pretty hard when I moved to India. I saw all these men and women that were literally risking their lives, pastors that had been beaten, women that had been raped, and they stayed faithful to Jesus in spite of it all. Some of them were kicked out of their families and villages, but they stayed faithful. I mean, those are disciples that will shake nations. You know what I mean? People that will say yes to Jesus no matter the consequence. Uh, These were the sell everything you have and buy the field kind of people, and I never really met people like that. And so for me, the, the, what the Lord asked me was this, Josh, if every disciple you made or every person in your church prayed like you pray, fasted like you fast, shared the gospel as often as you do, loved the way that you do, talked the way that you do, would that be a good thing or not? And for me, it, was, it would have been a horrible thing. I mean, the last thing India needed was a couple hundred Josh Howards running around, believe me. Like, just ask my wife, she'll tell you. Like, that's the last thing this world needed was a couple hundred of those. And so rather than being the big bad missionary that came and saved everybody, you know what I mean? I had a friend that said, Josh, maybe you should have made a business card rather than big bad missionary, just bad missionary. You know what I mean? Like, which, yeah, thank you, right? It was really sweet of him. He was a nice guy. Um, 
And so I had no idea what I was doing, and I had these big dreams of reaching the nation, but instead of me being that big bad missionary, what actually happened was the Indian believers taught me how to follow Jesus. That's what really happened. They taught me what it means to be faithful, what it means to live out the rhythms of grace in our lives, the, how to be bold, how to be courageous, how to live faithful no matter what comes, how to actually make disciples, not just talk about it or preach about it, but actually live that out. And so I began to learn from these men and women who were doing everything that I dreamed of. It was like watching the book of Acts happen before my eyes. It was, it was unbelievable. And so a few years in, we started dreaming about reaching the nation of India, okay? And some of you heard this part of the story earlier. I won't go into all that. What ended up happening, though, through a lot of prayer and fasting, and that's what we need to remember here, okay? Prayer and fasting is key. We've heard it all day. There's never been a movement of God throughout history that was not birthed and bathed in prayer and fasting. I don't know why the Father has done this, but he has tied spiritual breakthrough to prayer and fasting. I wish it would have been like to chocolate cake or something. That would have been a lot better. I don't like not eating, you know what I mean? But the truth is, it is a biblical principle that, that we find all throughout Scripture. Fasting leads to breakthrough. Fasting leads to spiritual chains being broken off of people's lives, off of cities, off of nations. And we are just really bad at that in the West. Let's just be honest. I have people ask me all the time, Josh, why don't you think movement's happening in the West? This is one of the major issues here. We don't pray and fast the way that our brothers and sisters in India and China and Africa do. We just don't pray like that. We don't fast like that. And so they were teaching us how to do that. So through a lot of prayer and fasting, we started asking God, what's it going to take, right? Not what do I want to do or what can I do? That's a lot of questions we normally ask in the West. Like, what can I do? Where's my gift mix? What's going to make me feel fulfilled? We ask all those questions rather than what is needed to be done. What's it going to take to see a nation saturated with the gospel? What's it going to take for every man, woman, and a child to come to Jesus? And that's the question our team began to ask. What's it going to take to reach this nation with the gospel? And long story short, we stumbled across these things called disciple-making movements. I'd never heard of a disciple-making movement. I'd never heard of guys like Curtis Sargent or Shadonke Johnson or, or Ying Kai or any of these guys. We, we had no idea who these people were, but we started to stumble across stories of movement happening across the world. Ying Kai was kind of my gateway drug to movement. I'll just, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what really got me going. And so we started hearing about, man, these huge movements in China and these huge movements in Africa – and so I started praying, and our team started to pray, God, if you could do it there, I know you can do it here. I know you long to move. I know this is your heart, right? My whole life, guys, I'd ask the question, God, what is your will for my life? And I had a mentor tell me, he said, Josh, you're asking the wrong question. That's a super selfish question. It's the, it's the Jemesis or whatever you just said, Je Jeff, you know? It's all about me. What's your plan for my life, God? I want to be the special snowflake purpose. You know what I mean? Like, I, I want to have my, I, I want to have my special plan, and and in all reality, this friend of mine said, Josh, that's maybe a good question later. The first question, though, should not be, what is your will for my life? But just, what is your will, period? God, what do you long to do? What is your heart? What is your dream? If you were walking Jesus in Cincinnati, where would you go? Who would you talk to? Who would you pour your life into? That's a whole different question. And so we get, begin to pray, God, is, what is your will for India? What is your dream for this nation? What do you long to do in these people's lives? And his heart slowly began to infiltrate our heart, and his will slowly became our will. And that's not easy for us because as independent, entrepreneurial, innovative kind of leaders, we like to do what we like to do. You know what I mean? And laying down what we want for what he wants, laying down our dreams for his dreams, laying down our little K kingdom for his big K kingdom is not an easy process. It's painful. It sucks. But it leads to so much more than we could ever imagine. And it allows us to live for something much greater than ourselves. And that is so much better. And so our team started laying everything down. We started going after it. I still remember the Sunday we launched, okay? This was when we were launching our movement, <laughs> American, right? Like, we're going to launch a movement today. It was ridiculous. It was so stupid. But Sunday, okay, I'm preaching. I'm at this church. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, 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 a missionary. Basically, it was planted by missionaries 150 years ago. There's about 1,200 people there on a Sunday, a large church for, for a middle of nowhere in India, 
And, and so, man, I'm getting up there to preach. I've got my sermon laid out. I'm going to tell Ying Kai's story on how he planted 200,000 churches in 10 years. I, I even have a calculator where I'm going to show how by multiplying disciples, we could reach all of India in 16 years, literally, one disciple every six months, teach him to do it again. It doubles every six months. You can reach a billion people in 16 and a half years. Can you believe that? Like just six months reaching one person. It was crazy. So I'm preaching this message, I, I, and if I do say so myself, this was the best sermon I've ever given in my life, okay? I knew Pentecost Sunday was coming, and we're launching a movement. Like, I knew it. And so I was ready, man, for the floodgates to open. I knew everybody was going to come up. There were only 1,200 people there, but I knew 3,000 were coming forward. You know, like, Pentecost is happening. Little Indian women off the street are going to come in with their walkers, be healed, and go make disciples. Like, I knew that's what was going to happen. And so at the end of this message, man, I laid my heart out, and, and, and I, was, I was preaching with passion and conviction and all the stuff you want. And I give the altar call, and I'm waiting for the floodgates to open. I'm waiting for everybody to come up. And let me be honest, we've all done it, so don't judge me. I gave a really low bar altar call so that everyone would come up. You know what I mean? Have you ever done that? Like, if you need prayer for anything, just come up, you know? You just want people to come forward. And so I kind of said, you know, hey, if you kind of want to maybe make disciples, come up and we'll show you how to do it. After preaching for 30 minutes about, you know, basically you're not a Christian if you don't make disciples, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just laying on the guilt. I'm laying on every, every tool I got. I'm trying to bring everybody forward. I give the altar call. And 12 people came up out of 1,200. I was upset, man. <laughs> like, I was really frustrated. I, I even, I mean, I was even saying, like, are you people not even Christians? Like, what is the problem here? Why, do you, do you not love Jesus? You know, I was so upset. I had a guy sitting next to me. He nudged me. And he said, Josh, I know another guy who started with 12 people, and he did okay. I still don't know who he was talking about, but it was a good phrase, you know? Still a good phrase. Um, here, here was my problem, okay? Jesus had the same problem. He had a Judas in the group, you know? I had 11, okay? I, these 12 people, here's what we did. We were gonna train them every week on how to go make disciples who multiply. We were gonna train them on simple tools that they could go use to share their faith and make disciples in order to launch a movement. That's what we are gonna do. We're gonna launch a multiplicative movement, you know what I mean? And so all these people, all 12 of them, they set these big goals, they talked a good talk, none of them did anything, okay? And one of the guys, like all these people that came up, I'm, I'm like, why did you come forward? Like, what are you doing? One of these guys, he was an uneducated village guy, he couldn't even read or write, and when he came up there, I'm like, God, like, I'll trade him for one of those, you know? Like, my baseball trading system came in, you know? I'm like, yeah, I'll take, you know, I'll give you five of these for one of those, you know? This one guy. All these other people, people that I expected something out of, they didn't do anything. And the one guy that I didn't expect anything out of, the guy I didn't think could do anything, after training him in two weeks, listen to me, this is a true story, in two weeks, he started eight house churches in surrounding villages, in two weeks. Every day, man, he went village to village preaching the gospel, and, and he had never done any of that. And I had to repent, because here's a problem that we have in the West. This is a major failure that I had early on and that most of us do. We pre-filter all the time. We pick people that we think are gonna be best. We don't pick the Gadarene demoniacs. I mean, come on. Is the crazy naked homeless guy the guy you're gonna put as an elder in your church? Probably not, you know what I mean? But Jesus saw something different in that guy and he chooses him, casts out the demons and the guy preaches the 10 cities, right? Nobody in their right mind would pick the Samaritan woman to be the evangelist of that village. Nobody. She was the outcast. She was the one that had the bad character. Nobody wanted to be around her. But Jesus touches her life and uses her to shake the entire nation, not the entire village that she lived in, okay? And so this guy, I mean, I said, Father, I repent. Like, whoever, I, can, I know if you can use this guy, you can use anybody. And so from that point on, man, we trained anything that could move. You know what I mean? Like, if you were a dog and could bark, we teach you how to say Jesus. You know, like any, anyone and everything. And so that's a big, this is what I want you to hear, guys. In your church, what is the opportunity? The opportunity is every single person that is a part of your church has, an, has a chance. They have the seed inside of them to start a disciple-making movement. Every single one of them have the potential for reproduction and to lead to multiplication. Every single one of them. You can't pre-filter. You don't know who it's going to be. You don't know the person that's going to be the next movement leader. Almost every person that I picked that have said, this is the guy or this is the girl, I was wrong. 
like 99% of the time, it's the people you don't expect. It's the people you don't think God can use. And he reminded me that day. He said, Josh, I love to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. I love to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. I wish I had time tonight to tell you my story of the background I came from. I, I have been a mess my whole life. I come from a super broken family. At 16, my, my grandfather, who was my, the father figure in my life, he died of cancer. A month later, my aunt got arrested for having an inappropriate relationship with a 13-year-old kid in our youth group. She was a youth minister. My uncle had to quit ministry. My mom became a closet alcoholic. I could go into this whole story. I was addicted to pornography from 11 years old onwards. Like I had a mess of a life. I said that I believed in Jesus and I loved him, but I lived a half-hearted lukewarm life my entire growing up years all the way through college and God picked up this broken lonely depressed frustrated mess and brought life into me that has radically changed my life my family's lives and now has used me to be some small part of a movement in India that has now seen for those of you that were here earlier it started with that one guy that's planted eight churches and now we're over 20,000 churches that have been started in eight years and he's using ordinary, broken, everyday people. And he reminds me all the time, Josh, I can still hit a home run with a broken bat. Don't discount anyone in your church. The opportunity is this. Paul was so clear in Ephesians 4 that our job, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, whatever you are, your main job is to equip the saints for the works of service. Our main job is to equip and release every single person possible to go make disciples who make disciples until there's no place left without the gospel. That is our mission. That is the core missionary task. And all of us are called to it. The question is, will you answer that call? And will you be willing to release authority and power and control in order to see it happen? We're gonna talk about this later but somebody once asked me, Josh, what do you think is the biggest thing holding us back in the West from seeing a movement? The first answer is always the one I gave you a few minutes ago. Prayer and fasting, by far, big issue. Second, it's control. We want our brand. We want our name. We want all the house churches to be victory life in Jesus church or whatever our name is. You know what I mean? Like, we want the brand. We want the recognition. We want the name. We want the book deal. We want the tour. We want all that. And celebrity consumer culture has completely ripped out of our hands the ability to see a movement of God. And we have to die to that. Last incubator, I was sitting on a Q&A panel and a guy asked me, he said, Josh, what do you think, what, what had to die in your movement? Or, or before you see, saw a movement happen, what had to die? And I'd never had anybody ask me that before. I thought it was a beautiful question. I took a moment, I prayed, and the answer came to mind immediately. <laughs> it was me. I had to die. I had to give up control. I had to give up desire to be known. I had to give up desire to be the name, the fame, the guy, the golden tongue. You know what I mean? The guy up front all the time leading everybody to Jesus. I couldn't be the hero anymore. I had to be the one launching out people. I had to be the one equipping and releasing and coaching and guiding. And so friends, if we're gonna see a movement of God, we've gotta release control. We've gotta release authority. And we've gotta equip and train everybody. Don't pre-filter. Don't pick people in advance. You don't know who it's gonna be, okay? Let the Holy Spirit do his job of convicting people of sin. Every time I try to be the Holy Spirit, I suck at it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a good Holy Spirit, okay? Just not very good at it, okay? But when I let him do his job and I do mine, it's an incredible combination, you know? Let him do his job, you do yours. And God has called us to pour our lives into people, make disciples, equip and release them, and you can see a movement of God. God longs to move in this nation. He longs to see disciples made who multiply, and he longs to use you and your people to do it. But you can't be the guy or the girl, okay? Listen, I'm gonna be real honest. In our movement in India, out of 20,000 churches, however many people that is, I don't know, a few hundred thousand people in those churches, okay? There's probably like 100 of them that know who I am, that even know the name of my ministry. They don't know any of that, and they don't need to. This is the kingdom of God, friends. Okay, are we willing to lay down our kingdoms for his kingdom? Are we willing to lay down our dreams for his dream? That's going to be the big idea here. What's holding us back? Okay, And how can we lay it all down in order to see something happen that we can only dream of?